Yeah. yeah. All right. The possibility of the ULA, and and with that, I must say that um, we have issued and I've signed many um, statements to say that the ULA will work with any organisation that legally works towards self-determination or secession. With that said, because of that statement, the possibility of the ULA and Cape Exit working together is zero. Mm. Now, let me, let me say again what the statement said. The ULA will work with any organization that legally works towards secession. So there are two caveats in that, legal and works towards. Now, the Cape Exit is not doing one of the two. Okay. Why do I say that? Very simple. Mm. Firstly, it's not legal because by bumping up figures that it makes you look better is illegal. And it's also illegal in terms of international law on secession. Secondly, works towards absolutely means exactly what it says. You've got to work towards secession. Now, I've asked the question a million times, what have they done in terms of the legal process of secession? Nothing. So there is no answer. That's the naked, that's the naked I know. truth. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Clive, I know that's not what you want to hear, but um, as I said uh, on this on this show, we talk about the naked truth. So that's just the way it is. <laughs> but listen, and I, that's I, I, the way it is. <laughs> absolutely. Um, please do get in touch with with Valerie. She is um, very very keen to to get together with uh, our members, and uh, you know the the one thing that we really want to do. Um, the, the truth is that we need to get to our two million mandate. She is one of the hardest workers, uh, using Heinz words, to, to get there. And so she would love to talk to people who are interested in participating in that. All right, Okay, great, thanks. Fantastic. Thank, thanks very much, Clive. Okay. So, Han, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to, to have you on the, the talk this evening. Um, Anybody has any questions for Hein? Uh, he's, he's obliged to tell the truth or the whole truth and nothing but the truth <laughs> on, <laughs> on the show this evening. So uh, please go ahead and, and raise your, your hand. We will add you to the channel and you can uh, talk with our president, Hein Marks. Hein, do you have anything that you'd like to, to, to comment on at this point in time? Just to give us an, an update on where we are. Well, um... Yeah, let's let's uh, let's talk about the naked truth. <laughs> the the ULA, um, we as the, the Exco people might think, and I've, I in fact have heard, Hein, but we don't hear anything from you guys. What's happening with the process? Let me assure everybody, we are working all as the absolute uh, uh, individuals, um, as volunteers, including that's Brett and everybody. As volunteers, we work every day towards secession. Every day. Um, it doesn't stop. Today, I've spent so much time on this again, it's unbelievable. My business, I didn't think that a business can talk. My business is already waking me at night and say, hey, we need you. <laughs> so I want to assure people, please, don't think that because you don't hear anything from us, that we're not doing anything. We are diligently every day working towards the solutions. And there's a lot of things we've got to do, which I don't want to go into at this stage, but we are working towards the solution. Why? Because there are people, organizations, call it whatever you want to, that are doing their utmost to make it as difficult as possible for us. Unbelievable. So, but yeah, I'm 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 here. I'm open to to any questions. Please, you can ask me anything. You can even ask me money. I don't have, but you can ask me, and I can tell you I don't have. But you can ask me anything. 
uh, fantastic. Thanks. It's it's always lovely to to talk to Heine. He he really is a very transparent person, and and the entire process is is very transparent. Um, uh, okay, just before I I have a uh, my own comment here, Richard. Thank you very much for joining the channel. If you just press your your uh, speaker button again, you'll be able to talk. To Heine. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to find out, um, is there some sort of constitution that's available for us to read and follow? And um, I only saw a couple of things on the website, and there were some one or two concerning points for me. So I don't know, where, where does one give input regarding that sort of thing? Uh, Richard, um, firstly, most, most of the information is on the website. Uh, quite simply because international law says everything that you do and everything that you plan to do must be made public. Now, that includes everything that we do. At this stage, it does not include the Constitution, quite simply because we haven't put out a new Constitution for no other reason the exactly the same reason why we don't just put an interim government there, which, by the way, is also part of international law. Why? Quite simply because we don't have 50% plus one of the people's mandates, which means if we put an interim government there or alternatively a constitution, they can say, but who are you to tell us what the constitution will be? Or alternatively, who are you as the, in this case, minority of the group to put an interim government there? That's the reason why we have, with the very serious possibility of a civil war in South Africa, a so-called emergency interim government. So that, I think, answers your question. Everything is there, uh, except a, a, a constitution, because we can't put it there um, for that reason, well, because we do not well, have the majority mandates. What, what I more meant was, um, let's say you do get the 51. So the way I understand it is um, you get the 2 million people to support. They put out a referendum and you get 51% of the vote. When that does happen, obviously, there's got to be this this whole area, and I'm sure it becomes very complex. But currently, we've got a South African constitution. The United States has a constitution. You get the 51 percent. What are we in for? Like, okay, what sort of liberties do we have that we don't have now? You know, like who discusses all of this that's going to go forward? Okay, so, yeah. Firstly, it's not 51 percent. It's 50 percent plus one vote. Because one percent uh, in our case means what is it? Twenty thousand votes. So it's twenty fifty fifty percent plus one vote. That's the majority. Um, what do you get? You get at this stage, you get the current constitution, which will then automatically, as quickly as possible, be changed with the majority to. A new constitution, meaning you will have the current legal system in place until you have a genuine democratic new constitution. So, with uh, people yeah. having their vote on what what actually goes into the constitution. No, you can't. No, you can't get people to vote in what goes into a constitution because um, the person that doesn't know um, a doctor or a pilot or a, um, whatever you want to call it is not a legal person. So it's not a vote. It's rather a matter of um, the majority then knows that it's under. It was done under the auspices of the majority. But it's still a legal process. So it's legal let's, experts that will do it. Let's say uh, some people want the death penalty and some people don't. Who decides that is what I'm asking. 
the 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 executive in the interim government, or in this, and then it will be the interim government. Uh, then it won't be a, 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 a emergency interim government anymore. The majority in the interim government with the legal advice of the people. But then again, for instance, we are already saying that we stand for the death penalty. This is all on the website. Yeah. So we are already That's... making very clear why, how we think. Okay. But we don't so... say it must be like that. That's we say this is how we think it should be. Okay. So just as an example, um, one of the things I saw on the website was that there's the death penalty for um, all the views are uh, for murderers, rapists, and then it went on to say for drug dealers and yeah, uh, yes, or treasonous yes. people. Yeah, and that that sounds all good and well, and, and personally, I probably agree with the first two, but. Now you have the death penalty for drug dealers, and then you end up with a situation where um, who defines and who's dictating what are drugs? So now you've got a government that's just you sort of back at square one in a situation where now they say, okay, well ivermectin is uh, a banned substance or a drug. You find with that no. thing, you get the death penalty. No, Richard. With all respect, I think we all know what we talk about if we talk about drugs here. We talk about Basically, scheduled drugs on the one hand, or alternatively, because ivermectin is a Schedule One medicine, one. So it's not a drug. If you want to use that argument, you can say that a disprint is a drug as well, because it's, it falls same, under that. Same could have been said for cannabis, where it was illegal throughout the world for what I don't know, I don't even know how many decades, and now all of well, a sudden it's well, used for medicine. Um, cannabis to smoke is considered with all the genuine expertise and experience as a drug. So you said that you don't agree with with uh, death penalty to, for drug dealers. A drug dealer that causes the death, the death and destruction of families and death of many, many people in our eyes deserves the death penalty because he's doing it for only one reason, nothing else other than self-financial gain. Then, then I could give an opposing view that a drug, drug dealer doesn't cause the death of anyone because you, no one is forced to take the drugs. It's, it's the freedom of choice. It's, I'm, lo I'm looking at it from a libertarian point of view now because it says Richard, also on the website. You're a Richard, we can always we can have different views of everything and anything in life. We want to have a community where people are genuinely free. People don't have to worry that their children will be fed drugs at school or in play parks or in cinemas or wherever. A drug dealer is doing it knowingly using current law, knowingly that he will destroy people's lives for self gain. It's as simple as that. There's no argument against that. I can't I actually can't believe that you said that you can argue against it. You can't. Um, I don't know. The thing is, as soon as as governments start dictating to people what they can and can't do, and your argument might be good and the intentions behind it are good, but you're giving someone a power where they can dictate to other people now or the entire country what substances they can and can't take what you can and can't sell and you know you, richard you so so what you are saying because you use the word you, you're saying it from a libertarian kind of way a libertarian kind of way is that you don't want any laws well good luck for that country that's got no laws so you can drive um at 250 kilometers per hour um, with a, a car that should actually not even be on the road. So he's putting everybody's life in danger because the government dictates to him that he may not drive it in our case. Uh, yes. You're saying uh, yes, that people so. can sell drugs because they may not dictate to other people. I've got a surprise for you. People are human. 
A lot of people does not have the ability to discern between right and wrong. In the uh, the human psyche, there are people that are drawn to be easier, addicted to things, things. For instance, to coke, to coffee. But that doesn't make any difference because it doesn't hurt them, but also to drugs. Okay, let me, let me ask you this then. What's your view on mask mandates and vaccine mandates, et cetera, et cetera? That we sit Very about. simple. Exactly the same that my, my mandate, uh, my, my, my view is at the moment in my business. I don't believe in it because it hasn't been proved. The government has been sued to show the so-called um, existence of COVID the virus, and they ignore it. So I don't believe in it, and I don't do it. And I walked out of a business today again because I refused to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. So what I'm getting at is you don't want to end up in a situation like this again where the government is the one telling people what is right and wrong because now the government's saying it's wrong. You're not allowed to. I'm totally with you. To wear a mask. I'm totally with you so, because if you look so at you what is happening in South Africa. be careful of the laws that you impose to protect other people because, like, let's say you get the right person in power and the intentions are good. Sooner or later, you're going to get the wrong person there. Because that's, this is happening throughout history constantly since the beginning of time, and we end up in the same place again. But Richard, what you're saying now is that to prevent that, we should actually all go and commit suicide. Because the reality is, you and me and nobody of us has got the power or the influence to influence the rest of humanity of what they will do right or wrong i can only influence while i'm alive and i can only influence within the sphere of my influence people that's all i can't do it outside of that but if you set up a, a governing system where it's not possible for someone to gain that kind of power then you, you, you would break that. Well, the, the, idea, the idea is to set it up like that. But the reality is there is no way in the world that you can actually do it. I mean, uh, we've heard for how many years that we've got the best constitution in the world. I can tell you now it's not the best constitution in the world. I can no, tell you now no, that the American all. constitution is better than ours. Yeah. And what is happening in America? A total, total political chaos. Mm. Too much government power again. Although they're off, they are faring a heck of a lot better than the West, the rest of the West. If, if I can just uh, ab absolutely, Richard, and if I can just um, add to what Hein is saying, and Hein, please, please correct me if I'm on the wrong wrong track here. But Richard, you you do need uh, somebody to make decisions and somebody to put the laws into place. Now, bear in mind that the country is divided into separate states and communities, and those states and communities can be completely autonomous. So if there is a law that says you, you're, not, you're not allowed to have disparates, and one of the states has a referendum within that state or community and decide, no, this is nonsense, we should have you know, uh, disciplines, I'm, I'm just using that as an example, then that that can be put into place in, in that community or in, in that state because the people are completely free and they can decide for themselves. And yes. any law can be vetoed. Any any um, civil servant, whether it be a, a ward representative or the, the, the prime minister or the president himself, can be put out of power through a veto. Yeah. You're totally right, Brett. Absolutely. Except you, you made one, one word mistake. You said all the, the areas can have independence. No, they will have. Mm. All right, because my, that's my, the way my, we've set up the system. Smaller the government, the better. Absolutely. Based very much, Richard, on that. <laughs> 
um, which is, you know, one of our most successful. Um, somebody's is feedback on somebody's line. Um, um, yeah, so, so that's how it's based. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so it's just a bit of, of static and echo. But yeah, so basically my my general view, obviously it's complicated and, and I'm going to have different views on a lot of different topics, but um, if a government is there basically only to ensure the liberties of its citizens and that citizens don't infringe one another's liberties, then you, I mean, that, that would work for me. Well, so that's this, exactly this guy can't I, murder me or steal my things or endanger me or whatever. But I mean, if I want to, like, just I just want to set the record straight here. Yeah, I've never taken drugs or took or anything in my entire life, and I never will. But I'm you. just trying to make a point. I'm just trying to make a point. Like, Understood. if that guy decides he wants to take this or that substance, like, I feel like you're just going down. And this is this is just one stupid example. I can I can probably come up with any anything else. You know, like. You have to take this vaccine because I know what's better for your health and what you do. Like you start going down that route and then again, you end up here eventually. This is the only thing that I'm concerned about. 100%. So, so let me, let me put this scenario, Hein, if I may. Um, let's just, let's say that, that, um, the UCS was in existence. We, we had seceded before 2020 and suddenly the world was flooded with this so-called COVID thing. Uh, what what would the approach of the interim government or the the central government, which really just caters for a, a handful of of things in, in a government matters, what, what would the approach have been uh, in the UCS towards this entire COVID um, pandemic? Brett, you know that's actually a fantastic question. I'm glad you asked that that question because exactly at the time. When COVID hit South Africa, so-called, and Ramaphosa said it's lockdown and all of this nonsense, the then, because he's not with us anymore, attorney or one of the attorneys of the ULA sat in my house and he asked me, he said, Hein, if we were independent now, what would you theoretically have done if you were the president of the country? Would you have had a lockdown? And I said, you know, Donnie, <clears throat> there is no way. And this is right that day that they declared this. I said, there's no way that I would have a lockdown to kill the economy because there's a so-called virus that we don't know anything about. Do I have to say anything more about it? That's my answer, because that's a genuine thing that happened. Absolutely. And then, of course, and if you jump two years later, you ask yourself the question, is it really about COVID or is it about world domination? Yeah, I think most of us know that it's very, got very exactly. little to do with our health. Exactly. But um, I wanted to ask Richard a, a quick question. He said he, uh, all of this, but he never said that he didn't sell or deal in drugs did you ever richard no oh, I'm a, no, no i'm, I'm just a, asking because you were fighting so vehemently yeah, for it no I'm, I'm speaking out of uh principle yeah out of i'm making examples um my, my point would be okay so what would you do um so that you wouldn't be able to make the decision at all so that people couldn't have a lockdown because my point is yes you wouldn't do it because obviously it's a stupid thing to do but uh someone assassinates you and buys out the next guy and etc etc and he would have he would have done it so well, that's why i told you earlier if, it's not yeah. possible to, to do it well, that's what I told you earlier. Um, we can only have influence on what we have influence on. We can't influence everything every time, all the time. Um, and if we don't like that, well, then we've all got to commit suicide. The, the reality is we can only try our utmost. I can tell you now exactly 
what the fathers of the American Constitution did in 1776 when they tried to have the best constitution for their people. The reality is it's totally being raped, especially the past two years. Um, we can only do our best with the knowledge and the experience of what's happening, not only in South Africa, but in the world. Knowing all these things it gives us just more insight in not to make the same mistakes. But I can guarantee you, nothing is forever. Nothing is forever. Well, and this, um, I just heard this somewhere, I have no idea if it's true, but the state of disaster that, that we're currently in, I somewhere read that that legally was only allowed for three months. I don't know if you know anything about that. Yeah, you're totally right. No, no, you are totally right. There is so no legal basis that they can push this on. It's all just a, a huge fallacy, basically. Yes, but but perhaps you've heard the saying, the person with the biggest gun has got the biggest mouth. Well, that's the case in any government's situation most of the time. They've got the biggest guns. They've got the police and the army and everything behind them. So they can actually make you do whatever they want to. That's why they do these things. They are criminals. It's a very, very uh, sh short and simple thing. No. Yeah, I mean, you, you've obviously got to think about this kind of thing so that you don't end up in the same situation again because getting this succession or secession actually pulling it off if it does happen would be quite miraculous so no. you don't you know you don't want to end up in <laughs> if you if you do it and you get it right you want to do it properly tell me uh, richard do you know how many countries there are currently in the world uh, I think it's approximately 180 something. No, you're wrong because that's the whole point. Um, you said if we can get it right miraculously. Miracle is exactly what it means. It's a miracle. It's virtually impossible. It, not virtually, it is impossible humanly seen. So, what you're saying humanly, it's impossible to get secession. Well, I've got a surprise for you. No, 193 no, countries have already seceded successfully. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't care. Maybe I used the wrong the wrong term. Um, I just meant it's very difficult. It's not easy. Well, you know what the most difficult part of it is. The most difficult right. part of secession is exactly why we have this discussion tonight: is to make people understand. We don't want your money. We don't want anything. Just give your mandate that we can get freedom. Funny enough, it's for the people that we want to do it, is to convince them that is the most difficult part. Because from a legal point of view, it's 100% clear what you can and can't do. And yes, 193 countries have already successfully seceded. Funny enough, in our case, in the, in the southern part of Africa, You've got Namibia that successfully seceded right next door to us. So why can't we do it? They I'm were sure totally 100% we part of South Africa. They're not part of us anymore. Up in Africa, there are how many countries? The last one that actually successfully seceded was South Sudan away from Sudan. It's easy. The legal process is the, is the easy part. The difficult part is to convince the people that there's nobody trying to do anything other than get their freedom for them as well. Mm. Sad, but true. Sad, but true. And uh, Richard, I hope we, we answered your questions. I'm letting it go on a little bit uh, with, because I don't see anybody else... <laughs> wanting to put their hands up and you're asking some very sensible questions and and the discussion is going in a in a in a, in a very reasonable direction so so thank you so much for that um it is it, it is just so true what Heine is saying and and we are absolutely looking for help in any help we can get to get the word out there to get to get the the, the mandates registered um we, we've got the guy Obed, I think he is on our call this evening he actually gets in his truck from time to time and travels through the Cape 
with his wife, talking to people, registering mandates, um, and, and he's, you know, having a whale of a time. Um, what, what we don't need is people telling us what they think is the right thing to do and, and how we should do it. Uh, what we are looking for is people that will actually climb in and do it because um, I'm going to use Heinz words again. I, you know, I've plagiarized these words and, and I'm sorry for that, but tough luck. The ULA cannot secede for us without us. We are the, the ULA. We are the people that are going to secede and form a new country. We, we can't do it with, without the people. So, um, yeah, we, we, we are looking for, for a lot of help there, Richard. So I, I hope you're more, um, uh, I wouldn't say convinced because we, we don't, we, we're not trying to sell anything. We're not trying to convince anybody of everything. But I hope it's more clear to you what, what we are um, aiming for and, and trying to do and that, that you will help us to spread the word. Oh, I already have. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. You know, for we've got 9 million souls that, that who's, who are at stake here, um, minorities in, in South Africa, uh, you know, compared to the, I don't know how many million um, of, of the other eth ethnic groups. Um, and, and for every person that, that goes out and registers or talks to somebody and registers their, their mandate, it's a step closer for us to have the secession and, and have a really beautiful world, peaceful and prosperous, um, that, that we can live in. Where does the two million figure come from? I saw um, someone mentioned earlier, I think it was Cape Exit or something. I actually came across their website as well, and they said 1.6. Um, Richard, very simple. In terms of uh, if you look at uh, our website and you look at the letter that, that I've sent to um, Ramaphosa in February 2019, uh, the, the total letter is, I think, 38 pages long, but the physical letter was signed by myself and the Vice President of the ULA on page number 21, I think. The rest are all just uh, the references of what was said factually in the letter, but also most of it are all the district, voting districts, mentioned by number that we are organizing for secession. So where does the 2 million come from? The 2 million is actually the figure where all the voters in those districts are approximately two, uh, 4 million, but it's actually a bit less than 4 million. Divide by 2 plus 1 um, gives you 1.9 odd million votes, and we should just make it a round figure, make it 2 million votes. That's where it came from. Ask yourself the question rather, where does... Um, Cape Exit's 1.6 million come from. I don't know. Okay. So but there I've given you not only where it came from, I've all also given you the exact voting district numbers in that letter, which is on our website, where you can see and then go to the IEC's figures to see the exact figures of each voting district. And remember, we're not talking about 2000 and 21 voting districts, we're talking about 2011 IEC figures, because that, that's when we started the process. They can't change the goalposts all the time, because luckily, law doesn't work like that. So, um, who actually proceeds to, to go ahead and supply this referendum? Is it is it... Uh, the courts? Is it the current government? What do you mean? Supply the, you mean, are paying for the referendum? Um, who, who initiates the process? You get the, oh, the initiates is very simple. The that moment that we have, the moment that we have the majority mandates, call it two million, but it's actually a bit less, but call it two million, the moment we have it, we then send a letter by the sheriff of the court to the president, all according to international law on secession, and we then, in terms of international law, demand a referendum. That's and not what uh, we say we want. That's what international law says they've got to give us. Now, the next question is, you will say, but they won't give it to us. Yes, we know they won't give it to us. You're right. They won't. Mm. 
So we will send them another letter and another one and another one. We can decide ourselves how long and how many times we want to send letters. And if they blatantly just refuse to even ignore anything, which is the way that they act, well, very simple. In terms of international law, we just basically, exactly the same as Rhodesia, declare a unilateral declaration of independence according to international law. Mm. You can't put your, your head in the sand and think that uh, things will go away. It doesn't work like that. You can you can not answer your door for two or three times or four times, whatever the sheriff of the court decides, but if you owe somebody money and he's got to deliver um, a, a summons to you, um, you can ignore him up to the point where he says, I'm sorry, now we just break the door down because it's totally within his right to do it. Okay. And that's exactly the same with secession and the Declaration of Independence. Mm. Does it make sense? Okay. Yeah. Um... Okay. Yeah, it's, it's obviously a very complicated situation because now you've got a lot of them living sort of in between you. Um, let's say I do something that goes against their law. We don't recognize them. They don't recognize us. I mean, what happens? Civil war? Richard, it's not complicated. It's actually very easy. Once you have seceded, you've seceded in terms of the legal process that you followed over that whatever many years that you've done it uh, in, and in that process which we have already made very very clear because part of of the um, secession process is you've got to determine and make it clear to the world who is your so-called group of people and in our case we've made very clear who our group of people is and in terms of the ANC laws we will use exactly their laws to then say in our new independent sovereign country the illegals must leave the country when you go illegally to a country like england for instance they don't beg you to leave the country they take you if necessary by force and put you on a plane to go back simple if there are illegal aliens in this country, which there will be, we will ask them. We won't come back. We will ask them if they want to leave. We will physically take them and send them to their own country. Simple. People don't like to hear this. That's a reality. That I, is the native truth. I fully agree with that. Um, and obviously there are plans for the kind of manpower necessary for this. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I'm armed, by the way. <laughs> then you part the plan. <laughs> oh, Richard, you weren't expecting this one. Okay, listen, no, guys, I'm, I'm sort of. Richard is, is, is holding the floor here. If anybody would like to, to, to join in the conversation, please uh, put your hand up and, and we'll add you. But in the meantime, Richard, uh, go for it if you've got anything else. Yeah, I can go on all night. <laughs> um, another another thing was going back to the sort of principles that the ULA stands for. Um, another point there was death penalty if someone is treasonous. Uh, yeah, that, that becomes subjective again. Aren't we being treasonous right now in a way? Not even close. Because treason falls, by the way, under the um, Geneva Convention. And even under, this is very interesting that you ask that. Under the, the Geneva Convention, um, if, if you are treasonous towards who? Your people, the country. Then funny enough, they've got no problem for the death sentence for treason. But they've got a death, the problem for death sentence against somebody murdering another one. I just do not have the mental capacity or the intellectual capacity to understand that one. I don't. Because if I murder somebody, I murder one person. If I'm treasonous against my country and my people, I put the lives of millions of people 
in jeopardy. Okay, fair enough. I suppose it depends what what the act of treason would be, or uh, treason. Treason that. is described under the Geneva Convention, and I'm not sure. I think even under the the um, what is that? Uh, what is it? Um, Helsinki Agreement. Very clearly. So uh, that that is not something that's made up by a couple of people. These are old international laws that that. I looked at. It's not a, a country with a, a dictatorship where a, a, an individual decides, like in North Korea, I'm going to shoot people with a with a, a, a cannon because I don't like them, or, or I just uh, this person might do something wrong. Let's let's just kill them. Uh, at the end of the day, you've still got a judiciary with the legal process still being on top of everything. Mm. That's the way a republic should work in any case. Supposed to work. We're supposed to be a republic. We are very far from a republic in this country. There is no freedom in South Africa. There's no freedom just about anywhere. Well, at the moment, nowhere in the world. And this is part of the reason why I say, when are people going to open their eyes to realize we are all in this world? But I'm not. I mean, I can't talk for not even our neighbors. Forget about the rest of the world. But we are all in a death trap. Let's get out with sane people and sort this problem out as quickly as possible. Luckily for us, we've started this legal process many years ago. Um, okay. Then the next question would be, uh, there was something else. So Richard, while you while you're having a look there, um, you know, thank you very much for for all your the, the points you're bringing up. You've obviously had a look through the website and, and done some some research on what you're doing now. Um, let, let let's say we have seceded. Um, it's 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 in the uh, you, you know it's something that's already happened. Um, it's it's a reality for us. What in your mind from from everything that you've Taken in from your 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 reading and and your discussions this evening, what is what is the thing that's going to be the most exciting for you about a sovereign independent country that um, works on a so, uh, in, um, independent uh, um, self determined states and communities and uh, you know all, all the freedom that one could wish for? What 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 would be the most exciting part for you? Being able to sleep peacefully at night and not worry about what am I going to do. Next year with my kids, uh, can I even send them to school? Can I work? Um, am I going to get uh, fired for you know things I don't agree with? Just being able to actually sleep at night. <laughs> that good would be to be a start. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, very really good answer. You know, I've I've uh, made a lot of good decisions in my life, and I, I find myself at a point now where you know I've got a good a good property and um, I can almost retire at a, at a fairly young age, I'm 32. Um, you know, I'm, I'm like afraid everything is almost for nothing. I'm going to end up back at zero if things carry on the way they are now and i got to sort of start yeah. all over again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the way it's heading. Are you in the Cape? I am in East London. Or where do you stay? You're in East London. Okay. So, okay. I'll hop, I'll hop in a skip. All right, uh, nice. Sell, sell everything and I'm there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Of course, yes. the so, is, what are you going to sell it for in this economy? Yeah, I suppose you'd have to sell it and, and have the foresight to put it on the market before everything goes to hell. So yeah. Obviously, at some point, Absolutely. the prop value of property is going to, going to take a dive. For sure. Oh, yes, if I can get back, I remember my other question I had. Um, forced military conscription. That's definitely not libertarian. I, I've, I'm sort of more in line with the uh, US's approach on their military. Um, what's your, your full uh, stance on that? Richard, very simple. America's got 330 million people. 330 million. 
we will be a total in the beginning of, well, somewhere in the region of 12 to 15 million. That's, um, I think about what, if I do a quick calculation in the region of about 5%. Um, our borders are in terms of total length compared to America's borders, I would say close on half, but call it call it a third if you want to, um, which means 30%, 5% doesn't add up. The reality is, let's go back to, and I wanted to mention this earlier, but I didn't. So let me get to it now. Um, there's a big problem in South Africa, a massive problem, and that is the attitude of our own people as well. Because our government, you can't, I don't know many people that has got respect for our government. The moment that you don't have respect for your government, most people also don't have respect for the laws of that country. So what is the problem? Where is the problem that I'm talking about? I'm talking about the fact that people are raising their children unknowingly without respect for the police. I don't blame them. Without respect for the army. I don't blame them. Without respect for the government. I don't blame them. But also for no respect for the law. I also don't blame them. But I do blame them that they don't have the foresight to realize that they are raising a generation of problem people. How do you get that right? Right, now let's get back to the military. Will you make it right by sending them to an army? No. But you will definitely help. There's no question about it. But let's get back to the 5% compared to to the 330 million of America. I was in the army. I've got no problem. In fact, I'm very proud that I was in the army. Did it do me any harm? No, not at all. And I was in one of the, the most difficult units in South Africa. Infantry school, Otsuarang. If you know anything about the army, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. We didn't do basic like the other cam camps. The total period for, for basics was three months, but practically, physically, they only um, chopped off for about less than two months. We did a course for a whole year. So nobody can tell me anything about the bad side, in inverted commas, of the army. No, I didn't die. In fact, I think it made me a better person. There's no question about that. But in terms of protecting that what we fought for, we, the country, must supply the people to do it. That includes the young girls that come out of school because there's a massive amount of administration tasks as well. Why were people so called when I was in the army, conscientious objectors. Why? I'll tell you one, one, one reason, very simple. Because they were politically driven by people like the Helen Zillers of the world. She was one. In fact, she was one that actually started the group, conscientious objectors. Why? Because it was one way of going against the government. There are certain things you said earlier. The government shouldn't have any rules and regulations. Well, that, that's, that's only in La La Land, because with all respect, I, I don't even think in heaven you can do whatever you want to. There are certain, certain things on this earth that must be done. And in this case, it's to protect the borders of this country. And nobody will die by giving, for instance, a year of their lives to protect the people living in that country. Because later, when they are 30, 40, 50, 60, 90 years old, there will be other children that protect them. So to me, 
With all respect, Richard, that's not even a discussion. I just, if I can just add to that, uh, Peter has just uh, reminded me on, on the sideline here that, yes, there, there will obviously be uh, military conscription for boys and girls, but people who, who prefer not to be in, in the combat um, kind of field, who, who don't want to, you know, go out shooting people <laughs> or, or, or walking patrol on borders or, or, or whatever, there are so many other things they can do during that one year or two year or whatever it is that 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 will be the military conscription they can they can follow careers they can build their own careers in in um in, in research in, in it technology for example medicine um and, and so on while they are doing their military conscription in inverted commas they will be building a career for themselves that they can follow once they leave the uh, the military is, is, is that Rick, also you're absolutely right mind? but we also must not forget Remember, we are only products of experience in life. And, and all of us look at life through the, the eyes of what we've experienced. Remember, our experience is that when we did military service, there was a war going on. We're not going to have a war going on. So it's, it's literally only, like you said, patrolling the border. So we've got to get away from this thinking of um, you'll have a gun to, to go into combat. <laughs> it's protecting the border. You don't have to shoot somebody that goes over, comes over a border. You arrest them. In fact, you... you're going to have quite a lot of problems if you do shoot somebody coming over a border. Have you... Uh given any consideration to just making it um, worth, you know, very worthwhile to join the military. With yes. A, with, a lot of with a lot of incentive. I mean, you don't have to force anyone to do anything. I'm very weary of, like, too much authoritarian government. You know, like, saying something is not up for discussion at all kind of thing is, yeah, a little bit concerning. Richard, I mean, it's Richard, all good and well. I, I, I hear I'm the that, one I, I hear the rules. This, <laughs> with all your all your your talk so far, you don't want any laws. Well, that, as I said earlier, no. that is nowhere in life it works like that. Uh, Brett said it very correctly that because that is part of it, and I, and, and I didn't mention it. That is part of the idea is that people can further their call it careers or start off with their careers in the army. But with all respect, it's not authoritarian. It is still a government. It is still the safety of millions of people that that government, not the individuals, that government is responsible for. So if you don't like it, that you've got to do army training, then my reaction to that is tough luck. Because there are millions of people that must be kept safe. We are sitting today with approximately 20 million illegal immigrants in this country. That, by the way, can get free medical treatment. Who pays for that? The government. No, not the government. The taxpayer. Who's the taxpayer in South Africa? Approximately 4.8% of the legal population pays 92% of the taxes in this government. So even from a financial point of view, you are protecting your people. So, no, so sorry, sorry. I don't like to go to the army because that's the authoritarian of you. You say that I've got to go. Well, tough luck, you're going to go. Does it make sense? Okay. Chucky has unmuted himself. I think he wants to, to make some contribution. Good evening, Chucky. Hi, good evening, guys. Hi, I'm, um, Richard, I just want to give you a little bit of insight um, as to why military service is actually quite good. Um, you're still on the young side, so you, you wouldn't really understand. I myself also did military service. And when I left the army and I actually went into the working world, what the army taught me was it taught me discipline, it taught me punctuality, it taught me respect for elders. But more important than that, 
it actually taught me how to think for myself. Now, when I was working for a specific company, it was my task to employ uh, people for the company because I was in a manage, manage, management position. And what I found is the difference between people that had done military service and people that had not done military service. There was a huge difference in attitude, number one, and in self-ability, if I can put it that way, if that kind of makes sense. The people that had done military service didn't have to be spoon-fed. Guys that, that had not gone to the military, and and I did find a few that were able to yeah, will work on their own and, and be able to think out of the box because of the way they were brought up. But unfortunately, in this day and age, if you look at how parents are bringing up the children today, there is no discipline, there is no respect, there is no ability for them to think past their noses, and everything that is on social media is what they believe. And they are so quick to go to Google and say, well, Google said that's how it is, so that's how it is. And that's not always the case. So military service does an enormous amount of good for the young generation coming up into the into the world to take over from older people. So I hope that kind of gives you a little bit more insight. Sorry if I've deviated off the, the topic. I just wanted to emphasize how important military service actually is. I, I don't disagree with anything that you said, and I didn't disagree with it before I said what I said. Um, that definitely would be the case. Uh, it's just the idea of forcing people to do stuff I think should be open for discussion and should just be very carefully thought out because maybe there are, you know, there could be other ways of going about getting a strong military, you know, incentivizing people to do it. I'm sure most most guys that finish school would, would voluntarily sign up for it in any case, especially if it's, you know, if they have enough incentive to do so. Richard, so you basically, what you're saying is that only the people um, that has got approximately a third of the border size of America with um, a fifth of the population, only the people that volunteer to go must go and protect the others that just don't want to go. Because it's actually easier and nicer to sit at home, play computer games, while somebody else is protecting them. No, sorry, that won't go with any person that actually starts thinking about it. So, I'm sorry. That argument that you are using there is 100% wrong, not 99%, 100%. Again, you're coming back to um, force. Tell me, what speed do you drive on the highways? Always 120 kilometers per hour, or do you drive sometimes a bit faster? I don't really drive sometimes faster. So what you're saying is that sometimes you don't listen to the government, but the rest of the times you are forced to drive slower. So why do you listen to the government? They're forcing you to drive only 120. Your your arguments doesn't make sense. Richard, I don't want to sound funny about this, but you're living in Lala land. Reality is that there are certain duties of a government that must be done. The security of its economy, of its borders, of its people is of utmost importance. Done. There's no question about it. If you don't like it, tough luck. That's life. Guys, we've, um, we've, we've gone over an hour now, um, and, and it's been very, very uh, enlightening. <laughs> I want to say thank you so much to Richard. If, you, if you've got one more uh, question, Richard, no problem, or anybody else on the group, uh, on the call this evening, um, we'll allow one more question, and then we need to let Hein uh, go about his, uh, his things. Are you happy, Richard? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm done. All. 
Hopefully someone <laughs> answers the question. <laughs> Well, it doesn't seem that way, but listen, we are here, remember, um, and, and we'll keep reminding people every Tuesday evening at 7.30, we, uh, we've, we've got Hein uh, committed to come and talk the naked truth uh, here on the ULA Liberty Channel. So let's, uh, let's hope everybody joins us again next week and bring a couple of people along uh, to, to join us. I'm going to post the recording on the Liberty Channel as well uh, as soon as we're done here. Uh, so you're very welcome to to go and have a listen to that and uh, send it along to to your friends. Hein, thanks very much for being with us this evening. Much appreciated. Um, it's it's always enlightening to 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 listen to you talking. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity again to make it very clear to everybody. Um, also to Richard, um, I like to have people that actually view their views but as much as i'm open to listen to to views um there's no sense in me listening if and i'm not saying you're doing it i'm, I'm talking about in general richard um, if that other other person is not prepared to listen and change their views uh, we've got to accept and acknowledge and understand that experience um with age sometimes sometimes or perhaps 100 percent of the times do play a role um we've got to understand that we're not busy with a an idea here we are busy trying to get freedom genuine freedom for everybody so unfortunately life is not always a bit of roses life is not always the way we as individuals see it, but we've got to understand and see the bigger picture. Because the bigger picture means some people will be unhappy for whatever reason it is, and some people will actually see why everything is done in life, understand and support it. So, Brett, again, thank you very much from, from my side. I'm, you do I'm sorry, would, would, would you uh, mind taking one more question or comment um, no, before you no, go? No problem. No That's problem. fine. Okay. Vernon, um, I've added you to the channel. <laughs> Welcome. Good evening. No, how's it? Can you hear me? Loud yes. and clear. Go ahead. Okay, right. I'm, 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 finding you, I'm speaking from Joburg. Uh, from the English part of Randburg, it's called Rond Borough. So, uh, <laughs> You're probably my neighbour. <laughs> <laughs> we settled with the age-old South African problem. You know, it used to be, excuse the word, a Dutchman thing, but now it's become a South African white thing. Yeah. We are doing too well here. Nobody is battling enough. You know, I don't understand why not why not everybody has joined ULA yet. Uh, they're waiting for the poor ball to strike the fan first. Instead of preempting the stuff, I don't, I don't get it. This is the typical South African thing, eh? Yeah. Vernon, yeah, you are so 100% correct. In fact, so much so that I've said many times, um, and Peter and Johan and Sean and the other people that are on, on here that have, Lawrence, people have heard this, uh, 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 Ina, Joyce, m m most, most of them have all heard what I've said. It's still not bad enough. But people just wait. When the poor poor hits the fan, it won't be running because the electricity will go off, but at least then our people will wake up, stand up, and stand together. Sad, but that's unfortunately, I think, a great truth because that's exactly what you said. Well, you know, the, 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 one, the one solution at the end of the day, if it really, if the poor poor explodes, uh, we're gonna, I can see us going the UDI route. Well, I can tell you now, I've said it many times. Um, we will go the UDI route quite simply because the blatant arrogance of this ANC government will force us to do that. I know because we've been dealing with them or trying to deal with them for how many years. So I know what I'm talking about in terms of this. Um, the nice thing about that is, that, well, the bad thing about that is, is that, that we won't have this total smooth transition but the good thing about that is is that then at least we know 
now we do have it immediately. Well, my personal opinion that even even if it's done legally with 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 the secession movement, uh, the pauper is all going to hit the fan northwards. Uh, but they can come this time because it's going to be a different scenario. You know, when you're in your own country fighting for it, uh, it's totally a different story. Eh? And uh, I think it's, it's going to happen. Unfortunately, yeah. it's, it's going to happen that way. My, my personal yeah. opinion. Yeah, Vernon, let uh, me just make it clear if I, if I uh, didn't misunderstand you. Remember, a UDI um, done with the legal basis of the secession process for the last how many years is still a 100% legal process. It's still, in terms of international law, totally within the law, totally legal. One, uh, yeah, just to change the subject for a, for a minute there, I have, <clears throat> sometime if I can speak to you and Brett personally, <clears throat> I don't know if I should <clears throat> go, go <clears throat> public with this, <clears throat> excuse me, the reason for the closer presence in the trans sky uh, is actually quite a interesting story, and my father and grandfather were actually the perpetrators of that. Why? There were no clauses there in 1950 and 1949. Yeah, but then you've got to understand you are uh, 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 public now. <laughs> so be careful. <laughs> uh, you must let me, I must actually get hold of you on, 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 uh, on, on your site and make, and make an appointment and a date with you and Brett and have this conversation. It's, it's extremely interesting. Yeah, more than welcome. Uh, Vernon, the, the, the reality of where we are at the moment is that um, more and more and more, and I mean, you mentioned it, and I just had to smile because I've been fighting for this since day one that I started this process where uh, uh, a lot of people have still got this whole, whole idea of Afrikaans, uh, Inkirkark, um, what else is there? Um, Kortbroek, Kamenikose, that kind of attitude. <laughs> that into, into the mix as well. Um, that's nonsense. We've long past that stage. But there are still individuals that hang on to that ridiculous idea. We, as white minorities, and living in Johannesburg, you uh, perhaps won't um, appreciate it, but if you really realize how seriously, seriously uh, dire the situation of the colors of the country, it's serious. It's very serious. Um, we passed that stage where we've got the, 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 <laughs> the idea that we can even say that you are English, you are Jewish, you are Afrikaans, you are Boer, you are Portuguese. That's, we passed that stage. I said it in an, uh, in an interview, I think it was in November or somewhere, uh, where I said, remember one thing with the people, it's the fact. Even the blacks that votes the, the ANC into government will be on the same Titanic that we will be on. We are all yeah. on the same problem. For us, at least we've got a solution on the table. That's what the ULA is doing. The sad thing is, yeah. the, the, the black communities that are supporting this ANC and supporting it and supporting it, not my problem, but there's no solution for them. Nothing. So, with the boats to get away from the Titanic, they'll sink with it. Well, you know, a couple of lifeboats have been thrown out now, luckily, uh, well, I think it's also a temporary thing with, with the last municipal elections and stuff here. Uh, fortunately, the whole of Gauteng has gone uh, DA action sort of way, except for Vrienich and Van der Weyl, who needs it the most, by the way. <laughs> and uh, it's a temporary reprieve. It's not going to be forever, but... Uh, we we all dying to see what's going to happen. Uh, Portal repairs and robots working, and uh, you know the normal the normal arguments that we have. But we're going to yeah, see what see, happens. Uh, yeah, we see haven't seen any results yet. What people don't understand is that in order for the ANC government 
Now, that includes local or municipal governments. In order for them to steal as hugely, as massively as they are doing, um, they can't do it on their own. They do it with, in this case, with municipal elections, with the municipal staff. Now, now the sad thing is, that same staff is still in, in office. So, well, you know, what, what, what's, what's the main thing? Uh, up to stop, and my answer to you is no, it won't. One of one of one of Mashaba's uh, things that I agree with, which is actually, he he is gonna his his policy is to get away from the small business. Uh, they want to employ workers in the municipality, no longer outsourcing. Which is the outsourcing has been the source of the problems nationwide. Well, it's part. Well, put it this way: it's part of the problem, because the uh, the um, I mean, the municipality can't do everything themselves. That's impossible. They can't have their own road department. They can't have the you know they can't have everything themselves because a lot of municipalities just don't have the capital to do it or the cash well, flow to do it. I remember years back, I'm sorry, years back, Joburg municipality had their own roads department, and they were. You know, or you can ask people when a when a robot stopped working, it was fixed in half an hour. Now it takes two weeks. Yeah, you t- yeah, you're talking about specific, like yes, with that kind of, of stuff, I totally agree with you. There, they've got all uh, uh, contractors that come in. The reason why they do that is quite simple, because that's where a, a big part of the um, uh, corruption goes on. But the biggest part of the corruption is actually the big. Massive jobs that they can't do themselves. There is, and I don't don't, don't think anybody's got a figure, but my personal opinion is, I don't think that (laughs) there can't be more than one or two percent of each and every, each and every tender that goes out that there's not corruption involved. Of course there is, but in the old days, the Joburg municipality had their own road maintenance unit, which is, to, you know, we're not talking about building new roads, we're talking about maintenance. Well, They had their own maintenance idea. units and they had trucks and they had tar, tar, tar laying lorries. There was no uh, tenders put out for those kind of things. They did it themselves. But, of course, all that stuff has broken down and been stolen or sold. You know, even the fire department, one out of ten fire engines working. Yeah, then you've also got to understand, um, then the the, the mayor didn't earn one and a half and two million rands per year. The um, the people that, that, that was elected didn't uh, earn uh, also in the region of one, 1. 1.2 million rand per year. Um, I don't think the, the mayor was paid at all, was he? No, he wasn't paid at all. They only got the direct expenses for meetings paid. That's all. He was, he was not salary paid. I remember Ernie that. Far, yeah. far was, the, was the Joe Burke mayor, which I know personally quite well. Ernie is, uh, well, I'm not sure, I think Ernie is about 84 years old now. He's just yeah. laughing at this. Sadly, laughing at it because it's a joke. Because Nobody then was, was paid. No. Nobody, nobody got paid. It, it, there was no money involved. Nothing. No direct expenses. The Joburg, the Joburg ward councillor is now getting paid something. I think it's forty-six thousand rand a month for a ward councillor. Okay, yeah, but, Bernard, that's, that's clearly not not going to happen in in our new country. And we've got uh, no. Doctor Sean Stewart no, on the line, sure. who's put up his hand. Uh, uh, <laughs> Doctor Sean, good evening. Hey, is that Sean Stewart? How's it, Sean? How are you going? Good. Very well in yourself, Vern, and I was hearing you chatting, and I know your story about your father's uh, uh, <laughs> racketeering. So we'll just leave that alone off the public arena. Um, yeah, I'm going to uh, I'm not saying anything. I just wasn't yeah. here for years tonight. That's all. No, that's why I sort of stopped short of of of, of going further. Uh, I'll talk I'll talk to to Hein about it and Brett and yourself. You'll get you'll get a get together one evening and tell everybody the actual reason why we've got that problem there. And uh, unfortunately, my family was was ninety percent the cause of that problem. Yeah, well, keep that on wow, the down low now, right? So let's move on <laughs> <Just> for now. <laughs> but it sounds like a fascinating story. Um, again, yeah, yeah. everybody, thank you very much for, for being here this evening. Hein Marks talking the naked truth. 
Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. And uh, to everybody, have a great evening. And join us again next week on Tuesday at 7.30 for The Naked Truth. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. All right. Bye. Thank you, Brett.